the Steam Deck, a device that I've been super excited about, as are many of us, I'm sure. It's being touted as a portable PC able to run the latest and greatest PC games with a minimal hit to performance. You can install multiple operating systems if you're into that sort of thing. For this video, I'm going to stick with the out-of-the-box experience to see how games from the Steam library perform. And also have a little fun with RetroArch. It's downloadable right through Steam, and it lets you play with a large variety of emulators. Before we start, I want to thank my brother Sam Acevedo for letting me borrow the Steam Deck for this review. He's a fellow YouTuber, and he does videos where he modifies his BMW and S2000. So I'll drop a link to the channel. Feel free to show him some love. Without further ado, let's get into it. So what do you get with the Steam Deck? Well, the Steam Deck ships with a sturdy nylon case which is padded on the inside to protect the console itself during travel. So on the park bench or putting it away after a couch session, the case comes in handy. I'm glad Valve decided to include an official carrying case with every order. Bravo Valve. You're gonna be glad you have it too because this puppy is high quality. Remember when you first picked up a Switch and it felt like a toy, all flimsy because the Joy-Cons wobbled? Yeah, this is the opposite of that. The Steam Deck has some weight to it, but it's not too heavy where it's gonna get tiresome, you know, holding it up and playing all the time. It feels well engineered, almost as if they prioritized how balanced it feels while holding it. The layout of the console at first glance appears heavily inspired by the Switch, but there's more to it. Sure, the touchscreen is in the middle with the thumbsticks and the buttons on the sides, but the placement is different. The thumbsticks are mounted pretty high up and they aren't offset from each other like the switches. I have big hands, so holding the console firmly while still having full control of the thumbsticks isn't a problem for me. People with smaller hands might find it awkward at first with the console at an angle. This layout almost forces you to grip the console high up and face it vertically towards you, instead of like at an angle where I think we're most used to. The D-pad and the face buttons are right up against the sticks, causing no real issues and it feels quite natural shifting over your thumbs in order to access these buttons. The two mouse pads underneath take over the console. While responsive, I didn't find moving the cursor with the right pad to be comfortable. Often over scrolling and moving away from my target on screen when I go to click it. The left pad can be used as a D-pad, but again, it doesn't feel any better than the D-pad itself, but the option is there, so that's nice. Start and select are up near the top, which I like because it ensures that I never accidentally press them, which I never did, unlike on the Switch. Under the left mouse pad, you have your Steam or Home button, which will bring up the main menu for things like Library, Settings, and Power. To the right, under the mouse pad, is the Quick Settings button to adjust brightness, volume, Bluetooth, and Wi Fi, as well as tinker with performance settings to maximize or limit settings like FPS, refresh rate, and limit processors. On the back of the console, there's four additional buttons, which is becoming popular among the custom controller community. With the higher than normal grip that I mentioned before, I found it difficult to press in these buttons with my ring and pinky fingers. The good thing is most games won't utilize these, but you can map to them if you need to. And of course, your left and right shoulder buttons up top complete your grip on the device as they're angled perfectly for your fingers to rest on. The screen on here is a 7 inch LCD touchscreen display with a 1280 by 800 pixel resolution at 60 hertz refresh rate. I think this lower resolution works well for handheld, it's all about how you put it to use. There's a more expensive model that comes with an anti-glare screen, and I hear good things about that one. I don't play video games outside that much, so I'm not concerned with the glare from the sun. But I do like to play in well lit rooms with all sorts of LEDs, and I did notice a bit of a glare even at maximum brightness. However, at night, the screen is amazing. Then again, I don't think I've ever come across a screen that didn't perform well in a dark room. My only complaint is that the in-game menu fonts at times are plain old illegible, at times causing my eyes to strain during tutorials. But I don't think that's an issue with the screen itself, but more of an issue with high-res games being scaled down to a smaller screen. So anyways, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. So I got this thing, and the first game I had to try was Cyberpunk one of my favorite games on PC. And after hearing how well optimized it was for the Steam Deck, I just had to check it out. Interestingly enough, Cyberpunk has its own graphical setting that by default targets 30 FPS. But with some tweaking, you can achieve more, but I just left it at that. I was actually happiest with the default settings, but with motion blur turned off. The 30 FPS wasn't an issue for me because again, this is a handheld and it felt smooth enough. There was very little slowdown in busy areas walking or driving around. Combat areas were also smooth. Some indoor areas with a lot going on tend to look a little blurry when compared to emptier areas in the game. 
I wouldn't be surprised if the cyberpunk graphical settings are using low to medium textures, but attempting to make up for this with high settings for the shadows and lighting, which I'll go over later. Dialogue with NPCs reveal another issue with running the game at such a low resolution, and that's the hair on characters doing their best to look somewhat acceptable when talking to them up close. It'll look a bit silly and may take you out of the experience, but let me assure you that the rest of your time with Cyberpunk, driving around Night City, completing side quests, and earning money on the Steam Deck is some of the most fun I've had since first playing Cyberpunk at release. Having such a rich and detailed world portably is something special. Doom Eternal is the next game I tried. I wanted to see how a true FPS felt like on the console. For some reason the game loaded up at 4080p, which I guess it upscales to 800p. The game looked great this way, and I would have never noticed if I hadn't gone into the graphical settings tab. I changed the resolution to 720 at 16 by 9 and the game ran just as smooth, albeit a little sharper and more detailed. By default, Doom Eternal has its textures turned up to Ultra Nightmare the highest setting possible, so I'm shocked that this game can run this smooth, all while retaining that snappy, responsive gameplay that you'd expect from a Doom game. Granted, this isn't the newest game in the bunch, having released in 2020, but it goes to show how well optimized the game really is. Shoot, I remember playing Doom Eternal with a 1050 Ti and being amazed. Next, I felt the need to test out a JRPG game. Enter Tales of Arise a very recent, graphically intense game. Well, as far as JRPGs are concerned. It looks like the graphical settings are set to high by default, which is what I use on my desktop at 1440. Tales of Arise is known for its ultra flashy combat where players tag in with super moves at any given moment. That fast action is preserved here, no issues to report. Previous games I've played on the Steam Deck didn't really do a good job of showcasing how vibrant the colors look on this display. I'm happy to report colors look dazzling as you'd expect during Tales of Arise. I'd say stylized and cel shaded games steal the show on the Steam Deck. Ride 4, a moto racing game, looks to target 60 FPS at 900p, which it seems to accomplish except for during a few corners where the frames noticeably drop if there's too much going on in the background. Even the super detailed first person view retains the smoothness at high speed. One important thing to note are the pressure sensitive triggers on the Steam Deck. You'll need to feather the throttle in Ride 4 in order to stay in control during corners. And these triggers do a bang up job with how accurate they feel. In fact, are these the first pressure sensitive triggers on a handheld? I think so. Let me know if I'm wrong. Again, this device is high quality. I'm glad they spared no expense because I believe these pressure sensitive triggers are a game changer for handhelds. The last game we'll cover in detail is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, a game which at one point was the game you used to test out your PC. I should note that the Steam Deck will warn you that Tomb Raider has trouble running, but it's still playable. A little disappointing for such an old game. But I mean, the game starts and plays and to top it all off, looks damn good to boot. Again, we see another low texture, high shadows and lightings graphical settings combo. And I get it, you don't really need high textures on a handheld, and it probably runs more efficiently using lower textures. I actually hooked up my PS4 controller via the Steam Deck's Bluetooth to check out if the button layouts would transfer. And yeah, the button icons changed in-game, and it felt like I was playing Tomb Raider on my PS4. No lag whatsoever, and the control even vibrates. So if using a controller with the Steam Deck is your cup of tea, you can choose to do so. Overall, I'm very impressed with how the Steam Deck runs games. You can tinker with graphical settings if you want, but I think you can get away with just firing up a game and going for it. RetroArch is actually the main reason I would buy a Steam Deck. A one-stop shop for emulators, setting up playlists for games, and adjusting and saving custom configurations for all your retro games. Just go into the Steam library and download RetroArch. Once that's installed, go into desktop mode, plug in your USB with all your totally legally obtained ROMs, copy them into a folder of your choice, then go back into RetroArch. I like to set up playlists for specific consoles, or you could load up games one at a time as you go. You'll want to go into Setup, Input, then Hotkey to set up a menu toggle. For mine, I chose Start and Select, which will exit any game back towards the RetroArch main menu, as opposed to having to quit the app entirely every time you want to quit the game. Yep, I learned that the hard way. 
what can I say, N64 games run buttery smooth. I'm using the Mupen 64 core, which you can find under main menu, manage cores. And you can also download whatever cores you need for whatever systems you're running. Even WaveRace 64, which usually gives me issues, runs at full speed. Obviously, your Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and Genesis games all run as you'd expect. Next was to try MAME, an arcade emulator. Unfortunately, the only core I saw was the Final Burn Neo core. But to my surprise, it actually ran all my games, which is an issue for MAME a lot of times. And you guessed it, at full speed. What a blessing it is to run all your favorite retro games and all your modern PC games all in one device. And that's the magic here, isn't it? A Linux-based handheld console capable of anything. Because if you know anything about the Linux community, they will figure shit out. People are running all types of launches on this thing, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted just the out-of-the-box experience, but I'm sure I'll mess with that stuff in the future. I hope you enjoyed my week with the Steam Deck. Make sure to subscribe for more. Now I gotta give this thing back. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.